Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin and stain he washed it white as snow Lord now indeed I find thy power in thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. For the throne, I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. A very good morning and happy Sabbath to each one of you. We'd like to welcome our church members, our family, our friends for coming and worshiping with us this morning. May you be blessed as you seek the Lord and try to learn more of Him 
and understand his character. This morning, I'd like to share with you a Bible verse, which is a very good promise for you and me, from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every work. God's promise is to provide for you abundantly. And He's a generous God. And if you trust Him, you can be blessed spiritually, physically, spiritually, emotionally. So may God bless us. Let us bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we claim this promise that you are willing to bless us. May we be faithful and may we trust you so that we can receive these blessings from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, a couple of announcements. Next Sabbath, we're going to be having our outdoor church service uh, on site at our church um, campus. So all those who are able to come, please come. We'll worship at 10 to 11 a.m. at our church. It will be an outdoor service. Um, when you come, kindly remember you have to put on your mask. Do not come if you have any symptoms of flu. Uh, and also make sure you put on a mask. And when we come, we're going to keep social distance. Okay? Uh, so that's very important, six feet apart. We'll be setting up, you know, a couple of tents uh, or canopy. So that way you can have some shade. Um, for those who are able to come on Friday at 9 a.m., Pastor Chris would like your assistance to help to set up and get the place ready for our service next Sabbath at 10 a.m. Uh, we will also be, um, do, uh, we will also be uh, what we call um, planning to do the communion service uh, next Sabbath. So come prepared with your heart ready uh, to participate in the Lord's Supper. Uh, today's offering is going to be for our local combined budget. Our combined budget offering has gone down a little bit the last few months. And so please kindly um, remember to support our church. I want to thank some of our members who have been very kind and gracious and generous in providing um, funds and donations to, to support our projects. So please keep in mind we still have the uh, lighting project, which is around twenty to twenty-three thousand dollars, and then we have also the uh, landscaping, which is about ten thousand. As we come to the end of the year, for those who have some extra funds, kindly um, give us this donation so that we can use it to beautify and make God's house uh, look better. Okay, and when you put the offering, just put down for projects, uh, church projects, and I'll make sure that we um, credit the amount in the right uh, budget. Let us bow heads of prayer as we thank God for all that he has done and blessed us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for being with us, caring for us, giving us strength, giving us work, and providing us the opportunity to know you, there are many people who do not know you. May we not take this relationship with you for granted. May you bless us and help us, Lord, to grow daily as we prepare for your coming. May we share your love with others around and remind them that your coming is near and that you are our God, our Creator, and our Savior who wants to be reunited with us. May we prepare ourselves well. We want to pray for our pastor as he breaks the bread of life this morning, that we will learn, we will grow, and we'll be drawn closer to you. We pray for all our church members, that you bless them physically, spiritually, mentally, socially, in all ways, Lord. For those who are sick, give them healing. And may you protect us from COVID and from evil and danger. We thank you so much that we can call upon you. For all this we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
My name is Josiah Cooper. Happy Sabbath. My name is Savannah Cooper. Happy Sabbath. My name is Isaiah Cooper, and the special music we'll be doing today is Make Me a Servant. Take out your staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community, so they and their livestock can drink. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, church family. Have you ever experienced a storm before? The answer is probably no, because you live here in Redlands. But when I lived in San Diego, I experienced a very scary storm. For me, that storm was very scary because I don't like the very strong wind that kept on pushing the trees down. And I also do not like the thunder and lightning that makes me want to crawl under my bed. Anyway, let me tell you a story that happened long, long ago in the Bible. One day, Jesus was preaching to a crowd of people. Then, when at evening, Jesus got kind of tired. So he went to his disciples and told him to, to go to a boat and bring him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So they did what Jesus said. And when they did that, while they were near the middle, Jesus fell asleep. And then, some time later, suddenly, a, a, large, a large breeze started pushing them around. And then, and then later, they also saw storm clouds. And then there were giants wave putting them left and right and everywhere. And then they were super scared. They had no idea what to do. So they went to Jesus and yelled, Jesus, Jesus, wake up. We are going to drown. Don't you care if we drown? And then Jesus woke up and told them, you of little faith. And then he went to the front of the boat and told the sea, peace be still. And the storm stopped. The winds stopped and the sea was calm. And then Jesus told his disciple once again, why do you have little faith in me? And then his disciple said, who is this man? Even the storm and the sea obey him. If the disciples were scared of the storm, just like me, but if Jesus can save the disciples from a storm, then Jesus should be able to save me from the storms of my everyday life. So if Jesus was able to rescue the disciples from a storm, then Jesus should be able to save me from a storm in my everyday life. 
Examples of storms are maybe sickness, maybe a death of a relative, maybe you're stressed with work, or maybe you have lots of worries, or job loss and fears. That's something that we all have. So let me show you an example. Okay. This cup is supposed to represent our bodies or our hearts. This vinegar is supposed to represent Jesus. And this baking soda is, to rep is supposed to represent our fears. So if we keep our fears in our hearts, let me just pour some in here. And we, it's just gonna stay in there forever. But if we bring Jesus with us, and if we put him in our hearts, Wait, let me just add some more. Jesus will bring our fears out of our bodies and create a new, and give us a new life. And even maybe after Jesus has saved you from your fears, maybe you might get scared again. But Jesus can do the same exact thing for you over and over again. See, Jesus will get rid of our fears or storms when they stay in our bodies. And with Jesus in our lives, we can overcome anything. Our fears and our... Thank you guys for listening. But before I end this children's story, let me tell you a verse. It is found in Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. That verse means to me that if I have fears, Jesus can still save me. Okay, thank you for listening. Bye.
Good morning, church. I have selected a subject this morning that highlights satisfaction that we can have in Christ. The world that we know today offers more avenues and instruments where a person could find satisfaction. You could be satisfied by having a car of your dream or traveling 100,000 miles around the globe while hopping one country after another. Or it might be a dream house that you truly work hard for or a fat savings account or just having sustainable cash flow or just having a little, a having a life which is healthy and well or having just achieved a certain success either in academic or job that would catapult you to a greater height. For some, a satisfied life would constitute having all this. For some, a satisfied life is achieved not merely by things material and measurable, but by someone that really satisfies the soul. As in some parts of the world, there are many who won't even know when to get to the next meal or have a floor that can lay their back at night. So how can a person derive such satisfaction if it is only achieved with what material comforts could provide. I believe that regardless of his status in life, God has provided each person an access to a satisfied life. Ironically, the Bible presents people who live their lives full of satisfaction, with such satisfaction occurred in the midst of challenges and tribulations in life. Looking at the lenses of the Holy Scripture, People that are satisfied the most are those who have suffered the most. And this is the irony of life. And this is what the Bible presents if we go and navigate and search the scripture throughout. While in some cases, satisfaction comes by achieving external wants and desires. The genuine avenue of having internal satisfaction comes through certain beliefs. Though life's achievements, amusements, and gratifications are real life pursuits, peace of mind, joy, and contentment are the conditions in whom each person finds absolute and authentic life's fulfillment. It is in this aspect that I will say Christ is the avenue of genuine satisfaction in life. John chapter 6 verse 35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You probably know this, this in experience, since the time you accepted Christ, that in Him all needs are met. In human standards, this claim might be judged as falling short to the standard of the practical demands of life. But by those who have known Christ and have found sufficiency in Him alone, their life is subject to abundance. For many, Jesus, in enough, it, as Jesus is enough for them as He is the one whom flow rivers of living water. John chapter 7, verse 38. As someone said, Christ for sickness, Christ for health, Christ for, for poverty, Christ for wealth, Christ for joy, Christ for sorrow, Christ today, and Christ tomorrow. Now, a person who has Christ will not guarantee that such a person has everything, but a person who has Christ is complete nonetheless. Such a person is completed by Christ. Thus, Christ is the ultimate need in all of life's businesses. Such a condition is when wants are no longer delivered by material things, but having someone who can deliver all those things to make a person complete, and that is no other than Christ. In Jesus' words, I, I, am, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. It is for this reason that every sermon is centered on Christ since without Him a person cannot find abundance. Charles Spurgeon, a great evangelist, once said, A sermon without Christ in it is like a loaf of bread without any flour in it. No Christ in your sermon, sir, then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. Thus, when a person sits in a pew to listen to a sermon, there should be an encounter with Christ. Because in Him there is abundance. In Him there is satisfaction. In Him a person can find its reward and its blessing. When the Bible is opened, a sinful heart should be delivered from a sinful way of life. 
or a guilty conscience should be delivered from doom. You may notice some of the popular sayings in sports, win or go home. Just this week, the president said regarding the stimulus, go big or go home. In every sermon, it is Christ or go home. This means that it is Christ or nothing. It is in Jesus that every message should put premium because in him there is genuine abundance and satisfaction. You may accept or deny it. Christ is involved in your life. The people of Israel were traveling through the wilderness in which it was a place where a desire of water is a genuine need, and such in a desert that body demands the most. Water is what the body demands the most. We have uncovered the last time the people of Israel tested the Lord in the wilderness by demanding water from Moses. The gesture expresses acts of cruelty, disrespect, and defiance to God's direction and to God's leading and command. Responding, is responding to such the rising onslaught. The Bible says, Then Moses cried to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. And I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. While in their thirst, the people exhibited tantrums against God. Try to imagine. Temper flares up. Anger burst. Hysterical voices sounded in unison against Moses. And it is actually against God. It is in those characteristics a rebellious spirit manifests and must be a product of a person that having clarity of the beauty of God's guidance and direction in life. The Bible is straightforward. Isaiah 58 verse 11 says, Where God guides, He provides. Again, let me repeat that. Isaiah 58 11, Where God guides, He provides. God did not guide them through the wilderness without providing them water. But sometimes God would put us to a situation where we are down to our last drop of water before He acts. Some expect God to act and His actions are concur concurrently within the parameters of abundance. While well, God in your life and my life entails blessings without a curse, God in His own wisdom and as a route to His glory allows us to pass some trials or come to a point of the end of the road or a final drop of water, if you may, or a final bite of bread. So in this way, he can prove that he actually provides. As to the case of the murmuring Israelites, God said, take it your hand, the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. To have a better picture, this event occurred when the people of God were traveling and right when they had started their journey through the wilderness, going to the promised land. It happened in a place called Rephidim. It occurred when they had just started their journey, or at least they just had crossed the Red, uh, the Red Sea. Now, it was almost 38 years after this incident. The Bible records an almost parallel story, but in different place. This time, it was before they reached the promised land. This time, it was in a place called Kadesh. The Lord said to Moses, num Numbers chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, Take your staff, and you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community, so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him, and he he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm, and he struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. Notice that in Rephidim, a place they came not long, long after they crossed the Red Sea, God told Moses to strike the rock 
and water will come out of it and it will satisfy the people. Now, 40 years later, they were in Kadesh, a place about to, a place in which they are about to cross the promised land. And they face a very similar experience. And the people responded in the same way. It was a same rebellious spirit and response of God's people against God's leading. But in both these stories, God provided water to drink. Contrary to their complaint that they would die because there was no water, God provided them enough. At Rephidim, water came out of the rock. At Kadesh, water gushed out of the rock. At Rephidim, God asked Moses to strike the rock. At Kadesh, God told Moses to speak to the rock. At Rephidim, Moses obeyed God by striking the rock. At Kadesh, Moses disobeyed God when he struck the rock twice rather than just talking to the rock. But in places, enough water was given to the community and the people. In both places, God provided water for them. In both instances, water came out of the rock. In the beginning and the end of their journey, Moses got water from the rock. While it is important to talk about the water, it is the intention of this message, however, to talk about the rock. Without that rock, there was no water. It is important to talk about the supplier than the supply, since as long as there is that rock, there is water to drink. While sometimes we are worried about our limited supplies, our focus should be on the source of those supplies. While we want to have abundance of water, we need abundant knowledge about the rock that springs the water of life. That rock is Jesus. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, And drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ Jesus. Paul said that that rock was Christ. The rock in Rephidim, the rock in Cadiz was Christ. Christ was that rock in whom everyone's needs, everyone's need is met. Here are four reasons, three reasons why, why relating to our study about Christ is supreme, our supreme need, and He is the absolute fulfiller of our satisfaction. First, in Christ, He sustains everything. Paul said that the rock accompanied them in their journey. As mentioned, the people's first encounter with the rock was in the beginning of their journey. They journeyed for 40 years, as it was in the second year that the rock yielded water for them to drink. The water that came out from the rock was able to provide them their drink, had quenched their thirst throughout their journey. When Paul said the rock, was a, the rock accompanied them, he was not referring to a moving rock or that the rock removed from its place and moved along with them like the pillar of clouds and, and the pillar of fire at night. On its direct reference, Moses has given rise to a rabbinic understanding that the rock accompanied them and provided them whatever, uh, wherever they go and wherever they went. The Jerusalem is Targum, for example. It is the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible. It says, Well given at Matana, that it again became unto them violent overflowing brooks, and again ascended to the tops of the mountains, and descended them into the ancient valleys. The graphic description of how the water runs greatly is easy to notice. The overflowing brooks ascended to the mountain and descended into the valleys in which to supply them with the water they needed the most in their journey. It's kind of an amazing act of God. Another source says that it again ascended with them to the highest of the mountains and from the highest of the mountains it descended it to them to the hills and encompassed the whole camp of Israel and gave them drink to everyone at the gate of his own dwelling place. And from the high mountains, it descended with them into the deep valleys. This is how God provided the water to them. This is how this water flows according to the to tradition. Now, the Bible shows that the rock in Rephidim is not the same as the rock in Cadiz. However, between the span of the 38 years journey, the Bible states that God's people had been provided with water coming out of the rock, and that rock was Christ. Christ with them in their journey, and His constant presence has given them supply of water. 
There was a Jewish belief that the water from the rock ran like rivers and followed them in the wilderness wherever they went for the span of 38 years. Now you might ask, why did God wait for the people to complain until He gives the water? Did He not know that they were in the desert and water is, the, is a main necessity? Why did God wait for them to thirst for, to the point of the rebellion and, and not just supply them enough so they don't challenge Him? Now for 48 years, God supplied them the water they needed. But the rock stopped giving water to give them the trial of their faith in Kadesh right before they entered the promised land. God tried them while they are starting their journey and God tried them and tested them before they entered the promised land to test them how they have learned God's provision in the past while they were in their journey. That as they entered the promised land, God has supplied them the water they needed. And God will continue to supply them their needs as they settle in the promised land. That is how God acts. He tests, but He provides. The water from the rock did not just stop their complaints, but supplied them throughout their journey. The rock accompanied them, meaning Christ was with them, and accompanied them throughout their journey. It was the first manifestation of Christ in this journey, as alluded in other parts of the scripture, namely in Paul. Paul uses the rock to represent Christ. The thirsty people drank from the stream, fetched from the rock, which followed them throughout their journey. Here is the thought. Once Christ is present in your life, He will never leave you nor forsake you, neither He abandons you. Christ followed them in their journey. Christ is the stream in which a fresh water streams um, from, from it. Fresh water comes from it. Every believer drinks in Him. And once they do, they will never thirst again. Jesus said, But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst in them. The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John chapter 4 verse 14. Jesus said, They will never thirst again. Everyone who drinks in this spiritual rock has the privilege of the constant supply of water guaranteed by the company of Christ's presence. The word sustainability is a much desired word. The world only dreams of things that are sustainable, things that are important and we value the most, are not by nature sustainable. Marriages are not sustainable. New cars are not sustainable. Good financial possessions are not sustainable. But Christ who was with them in the beginning of their journey, put up with them despite of their conti to continued disobedience because Christ is the only one that is sustainable. Christ never runs from you, never hides from you, always available for you, always present for you. He promised, Behold, I am with you always. He is ever present and is always providing. In Him, the source of the springs of water that not only satisfies our inner spirit in our current journey, but it springs up until we reach the promised land. Life is accompanied with difficulties, and sometimes we pass through tough times. The gate of life is too narrow to enter at some, sometimes, and its road is too narrow to pass. At times we would think, we can pass this life, for the test sometimes is overwhelming. The burden is great, and the pain and challenges are devastating, and crushes our spirit. But it is in those difficulties that God opens up the fountain of life to us in Christ Jesus. In Christ, God provides to us water to drink. Isaiah 43 verse 20 says, Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so that my chosen people can be refreshed. Christ supplies His chosen people rivers of water when life is dry and even in a life characterized by a wasteland or barrenness. In Christ, people can be refreshed. There is water that comes out from Him that sustains God's people throughout, in, throughout their journey. Christ's grace is always sufficient, never ceases, never ends. His grace is like a river of water for those who are walking in a dry and wasteland. His grace runs to and fro, ascending to the mountains and descending again and runs 
around his people to renew their strength and enable them to continue their journey. He provides them eternal water to drink, even when they move backwards or forwards. Imagine God's people living in changing circumstances each and every day. The only assurance they have in this journey is God's presence. But in such changing situations, God did not only lead them, but He provided for them. God's supply of grace in Christ is unfailing and always refreshing. Let me repeat that. God's supply of grace in Christ is unfailing and always refreshing. Throughout their journey, in winter or in summer, in fall or, or in spring, they were sustained by the water directed from the rock. The journey might be difficult, nevertheless, God sustains them. At times, we stand before God and even before others as sinful and woeful men and women. But Christ guarantees that His grace never fails and refreshes us in our every need. In our, very, in our hopeless situation and circumstances, while we might not be on the exact track as God's people in the past, we, however, have our own journey of disappointments, wants, sufferings, and scarcity. And He who satisfied God's people in the past can satisfy His people in the present. The purpose of His grace is to quench our thirst and so we can continue on in this journey. God provides our very deepest needs each and every day, so our spiritual vitality is renewed, and we can carry forward and onward to this journey so that our goal will be completed. The grace of God flows from Christ and flows from Him abundantly. He sustains us like no other things and no other beings. We cannot find anybody that can sustain us in this journey or in this manner. If you come to realize that you will experience a degree of certainty of Christ's presence in your life, if Christ cannot sustain us, then who will? And then there is sufficiency in Christ Jesus. So there was sustainability in Christ. Now there is sufficiency in Christ. The Bible says that the water gushed out of the rock. Numbers 20 verse 11. The moment Moses struck the rock, there was no delay and the rock yielded abundant water. The water gushed out. The expression in Hebrew for gush out means that the water came out more than expected, more abundantly, more than anticipated, meaning more than sufficient for them. It was an awesome display of God's sufficient supply in which those who witnessed had exclaimed it was more than enough for them. There was an excess of the water that was delivered to them. It had suffices their thirst and need, and it supplies them exceedingly great. The imagery, the imagery in Psalms provides a more vivid description of this. In Psalm 114 verse 8 says that God turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. Moreover, in Psalm 78 verse 15 to 16 say, He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He broke the streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. This is what the sufficiency of Christ looks like. The rock turned into a pool, but more abundantly, it flows like a river. And the water that comes from the rock is abundant as the mighty seas. This shows God's solution to the scarcity of life. The water followed them and served them sufficiently. Moreover, the quality of the water is like no other. The water that came out of the rock is of the highest quality. Deuteronomy 32 verse 13 says, He nourished them with honey from the rock and with the oil from the flinty crack. The water coming out of the rock is a superior water. It was called honey and oil. Note that the quality of the water was incom incomparable as it was compared to honey. And oil. Also that the water was as abundant as the seas. Not also that the moment Moses struck the rock, the water gushed out of the rock immediately without delay. God gives the best for His people. The grace of Christ is the sweetest form of grace. Christ is the sweetest form of grace. It was a grace where once tasted, always wanted. The grace of Christ satisfies not only thirst, throat, our throat, 
not only satisfies our throat, but it satisfies us internally. His grace is not like a grace that could come from a human being like us. His grace is superior and tastes like no other. Christ's grace is also available without delay to those who are availing. Those who are thirsty with God's grace because their journey in sin is too long and too exhausting, exhausting for them. It is a water that would quench their thirst. Christ's grace is not only superior, but always available. If I say this, you might ask for a great job, good house, nice car, and God would say, wait, but when you ask for His grace, He will ready to give it to you. It is always available and given without delay. God's grace in Christ always flows like rivers and pours like seas in the wilderness. God's grace is available for humankind, regardless of who they are. Our access to God is the same as with others. The grace of Christ poured out from the rock of Mount Calvary supplied the whole world with the abundant grace of God. This grace, as the song says, marvelous grace. It is He only who can transforms, transform our lives, even the worst of them, even the worst of us. It is in this truth that Christ stands above the rest, even the greatest greats of the world. According to his study, Socrates taught for 40 years, Plato taught for 50 years, Aristotle taught for 40 years, and that is a combination of 130 years. Yet Christ taught for three years, but he infinitely transcends the impact of this great man. Why? Because in him there is grace, the grace of living water that founts from him within, in which it flows abundantly. When you come to assess your life, you will come up with this great truth that your greatest need is the greatest great grace of God in Christ Jesus. It is not the ability to speak as Moses didn't have it. It was not the ability to store knowledge in your gray matter as Paul had it. It was not, it's not the ability to earn money as Zacchaeus had accumulated it. Not the ability to strike a giant as David concurred it through it. But the ability resides in the grace of God. Paul discovered this when he wrote, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Christ's grace is always sufficient, and it flows like a river with a continual supply. And it flows like a sea with unlimited provision to everyone who comes to Him. Here is the beautiful picture of God's grace and mercy in this story. As the people of God rebelled against God, He responded by ordering Moses to take his rod. The rod that was used to punish the Egyptians, now it is to be used to strike the rock. He, didn't, he did not command Moses to strike the people in spite of the of their rebellious act but to strike the rock. But he said clearly to him, strike the rock. Instead of punishing them with the rod, he commanded that the rock should be stricken and be punished. And by doing so, the water flowed from it. Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 say this, this concerning Christ. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Christ took the pain. He was stricken, suffered, punished, and afflicted. Those are for us supposedly. But Christ was our substitute. However, God rather had done it so. As like Moses he struck the rock and sufficient waters flowed. Christ being stricken by God, His sufficient grace flowed to all of us. God does not only possess great power, but great pity and mercy to all of us. So my question is, if Christ is not sufficient for us, who else? And then the last one is the superiority of Christ. The Bible says that God is the rock. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4 says, he is the rock. His works are perfect, and all His ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just is He. Second Samuel 30, 22, 32 says, For who is God, save the Lord, 
And who is the rock? Save our God. Now, Matthew 18, 16 says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In the New Testament, nowhere an, an individual Christian is called Petra or rock. Rightly understood, Christ alone is Petra, the rock. He is the rock. Christ being the rock proves his divinity and superiority. The water he gives is of divine origin and superiority. Christ acted in history. In the wilderness, before he was born, he was the rock that supplied superior and abundant waters for his people while they were on their journey. Now for, belie for believers, Christ is the rock in which our faith is built. And the power of darkness and evil can overcome us because nothing can overcome Christ. As he was the source of water in, in to them, he also provides abundant and superior waters for us today. Everything in Christ is superior. Nothing can we compare. His supply to us meets our needs and our desires. Many times we seek our own well and dig our own pits. We want to quench our own thirst from our own waters, but those cannot truly satisfy our deepest needs. Our pleasures cannot satisfy us unlike how Christ satisfies us. The water comes from, the, from Christ, brings supernatural spiritual delights. If they were pure, refreshing, and superior. If Christ is superior above others in your list of needs, then you have the best quality of life. His superiority gives you superior endurance of faith. Your love will be immovable. Your righteousness is unquenchable. And your foundation is immovable. Because he abides with you forever. As someone says, Christ my teacher, Christ my guide, Christ my rock, in Christ I hide. So my question is, if Christ is not the most superior in you, who else? Invite Christ in your life today. Affirm your faith in Him. If you haven't accepted Him before, accept Him because He is the living rock in whom abundant water of life will gush out. God bless you this morning.